Hello and welcome. I'm June Bianchi and I'll be presenting a session to you supporting diversity and inclusion through art and design. And the session is designed to help develop your pedagogical and subject skills. So first of all, looking at the session links, this session is also linked with a webinar, uh, which I have uploaded into the PGC Art uh, Minerva. And that webinar is, a, is also focusing on the issues of inclusion. And it is looking at it in relation to culture, inclusion and empowerment. So these two sessions are very closely linked. The session is also linked with your American Museum field trip. And all through the session, I'll be asking you to extend your understanding, reflect on uh, issues you're presented with. When you meet together, you can discuss these issues and also you will be making. So you'll be looking, thinking, reflecting, discussing and making in relation to these issues. And the aims of the session, first of all, to foster inclusive pedagogy for diversity within art and design across a range of settings. This is an absolute key skill for your future as an art and design educator. To address unconscious bias, something that we all have and need to acknowledge and address and promote understanding of diversity and inclusion through art and design. To develop your subject skills and processes in textiles and screen printing and help you to plan for inclusion, to consider how to def differentiate for adaptation. So first of all, with all my presentations, I will tend to start with a bit of theoretical background. And um, I'll just say now that there is an accompanying document to this webinar, and that is the link document, which has uh, the links to the readings, um, the museum links, and also further textile research links. So you'll need to have that open alongside this, and you will need to be looking at some of the links as we go. So this is a quote that I've also included in the, um, the, the additional webinar that I've already mentioned. Um, and that is that successful inclusive practice will be successful for all children with many different attributes such as ethnicity, language, gender and socioeconomic status. Those points actually pinpoint some of the protected characteristics and I won't say much more about that because there is more information in the accompanying webinar um, on this issue. But there is a link uh, if you want to look at it um, to confirm what those protected characteristics are. And that is included in the link for this session. There is a code of practice for um, special educational needs and disabilities within education that was written in 2014 and updated in 2020. Again, there's a link within the link documents. Recognising and addressing unconscious bias, a very important aspect for us all. And again, this is picked up within the, the other webinar, but I just wanted to flag it up to you. And again, you will find um, the link to that uh, in the links document. So what we're looking at is bringing these aspects together in order to promote inclusive pedagogy and understand and celebrate diversity. And through doing that, we will be supporting empowerment within our art and design curriculum. So I've got a couple of readings um, linked with this, uh, this presentation, um, and they're my own readings. Um, I tried to include some of my own uh, research, um, artwork, projects, and publications. Um, I think it's, it's interesting to have that as a model, um, how we operate as artists, researchers, teachers. 
And that is the model that you'll be developing throughout this course. So the reading is, uh, it was 2011, Intercultural Identities Addressing the Global Dimension Through Art Education. And here's just a short quote from it. The fostering of tolerance and appreciation of diversity should be regarded as intrinsic within an academically ambitious curriculum, not a tangential pursuit antithetical to achievement. Cultural intelligence represents a fundamental attribute of a global education system which recognises the pluralist nature of 21st century society and aims to equip young people for their role within it. So what I'm saying now is it's not an add-on to understand, celebrate and provide for diversity to have an inclusive curriculum it shouldn't be just an add-on. It should be at the heart of everything we do. So going back again to 2011, this is another quote from Think Global, Think Global Development Education Association. Believe that we live in an independent, interdependent world and meeting the global challenges we face, such as international poverty or climate change. These are issues that haven't gone away since 2011. In fact, they're, if anything, more current. Will require people in the UK to think more globally. Think Global encourages children to engage with the global challenges we face and develop the capabilities to create a more just and sustainable world. I'm sure many of you will think it's never been needed more than it is at the moment. Um, and bringing it bang up to date, here is um, a document from the Higher Education Academy, which I'm sure you'll find very interesting. It's entitled Embedding Equality and Diversity in the Curriculum, a Model for Learning and Teaching Practitioners. And the link is there within the link documents. And that is a recent document um, which should help you to uh, develop in your pedagogy and practice uh, an approach which actually puts equality and diversity at the heart of your teaching life. So looking at that pedagogy, here's another quotation um, from Ciela Draffin and Wade, Studies in Higher Education, talking about empowerment, which is also a core issue within the other webinar um, that is uh, timetabled for you to look at tomorrow. The empowerment model encourages us to move away from thinking about the deficits of disabled students and positioning them as passive reliant recipients of diagnosis and remediation services and to instead move towards an approach whereby the strengths of disabled students are recognised and the focus is on supporting learners in pursuing their goals. Well, you see from the protected characteristics, um, I'm touching throughout this presentation on some of those and um, people with disabilities are, uh, are covered within one aspect of the protected characteristics as are issues of uh, gender, um, sexuality, um, ethnicity, culture, and there are a number of others which you can see on uh, the website and in the additional webinar. Uh, but that I think is important, that moving away from seeing people as passive recipients and seeing people who are genuinely engaged with their own lives and are given choices and are taking those choices and taking agency within their own lives. And um, Three Ways Special School, which is a school I've worked with over many years, um, has some brilliant case studies of this and the, uh, the, the link is there if you want to look them up and see some of their case studies on their website. So you've just done a cultural trip, a field trip to the American Museum and um, you're in the position of, of absorbing what, what you've seen, thinking about what your experience was like. Um, and what I'd like you to think about is just, again, this is one of the second reading um, that I uh, published in 2017, Cultural Placements, A Sense of Self, A Sense of Place. And in it, I, I discuss what 
cultural institutions are and how we consider them. So I've said the term is a broad one with potential settings incorporating a diversity of scale, budget, aims and agenda. British cultural investment reflects eclectic knowledge and interests with museum collections, including historical and contemporary art, ethnograph ethnography, science, natural and local history, performance venues, which host a range, a diversity of local, national, international companies and differently able performers and multilinguistic productions. These are all things I've actually seen in this local area where we have a very rich uh, opportunity to engage with a very diverse uh, cultural experience. And um, who is engaging with it? How are diverse visitors being uh, encouraged to come into to institutions? And how are they provided for when they get there? To what extent do cultural institutions promote inclusive pedagogy? So I've thought about that in, in this, um, this, this article, which you can read the link is there in the link documents. I've thought about it and I've discussed, discussed it in relation to um, a number of museums, but specifically the Holborn Museum in Bath, which we'll talk about in a little while. And I want you to think about your American museum visit. Um, how are they engaging with the diversity of America? To what extent does the American museum include the experiences of all Americans? To what extent does it acknowledge its debt to um, the First Nation people of America, um, to the um, African Americans who live there, and the many other cultures and ethnicities who, who are part of American society. So what I'd like you to think about is how do you think that uh, in your work with the American Museum, if you are developing a project or some resources, how could you bring out diversity and how could you promote diversity in relation to that museum experience? And thinking about how this would work across a range of local museums, um, I've given a selection of museums with the links. They're all in the link document. Um, number from Bath, a number from Bristol, just focusing in on our immediate cultural hub. Um, and it's a spectrum of, of history museums and fashion, industrial museums, science museums um, and fine art museums. And so I suggest that you dip in and if possible, try and visit as many of these as you can. Um, with, your, uh, with your student card, uh, in many of them, you will either get in free um, or at a reduced rate. And if you're a bath residence, then you will get in free to the Roman baths, um, the Fashion Museum, uh, Victoria Gallery, and um, a number of others, and some are free anyway. The Bristol Museums are mainly free. The Onolfini is free, um, reduced rate at We the Curious, and free with, a stu with your student card to the Holborn. So you can sample a range, and you can think about how do these museums and galleries promote diversity and inclusion? First of all, through their websites, um, do their websites actually foster uh, participation and engagement from diverse audiences? Um, and do they acknowledge the experience of diverse people? And also, how successful are they uh, in terms of meeting their learning program aims? Because, of course, galleries and museums have to compete every year for funding. And some of these that are on the list aren't publicly funded. The Holborn Museum is actually a privately funded gallery, and so it needs to bring in revenue. It needs to attract people in, but it also needs, as they all do, to meet the requirement to move with the times, have uh, an expression of awareness of current concerns and issues and current sensibilities and awarenesses 
which have changed over time and have certainly changed since many of those museums were set up. So that is certainly the case in terms of the Holborn Museum, which is a museum in Bath. It's um, based in a rather splendid building and um, it houses the Grand Tour collection along with other artefacts. But the Holborn Museum was started first of all by Sir William Holborn's Grand Tour of Europe where he made an extensive collection of art and artefacts. And one of the issues that really has emerged more in recent years, and particularly since Black Lives Matter um, in the last couple of years, that the Holborn wealth uh, did actually have a stain on it, if you like, and as in many museums, many stately homes, and in fact, many cities were developed, if not all, um, based on the money from the plantations and the trading in enslaved people. And this is uh, as, as a country who have colonized and have been colonizers um, for centuries, this is a history that is being gradually owned and made more open. The Holborn building was part of Sir William Pulteney's wider urban development funded with money derived from the profits of the same West Indian sugar trade. The Holborn are also investigating objects related to empire and slavery and the lasting damage of colonialism. And this is something that is happening all over the UK, certainly, and in other countries. Um, there is some very good material here. If you go into the Holborn um, website and um, there is a section, Legacy of Slavery, I've given you the link here, uh, where you will find a series of videos that relate specifically to that, um, that history. And um, it is something that we could question and say, to what extent should all museums do this? Because uh, certainly museums that were set up um, in the Georgian or uh, Victorian period or uh, even up through the early part of the 20th century will have that history um, and there is concern as well uh, in more contemporary buildings um, and contemporary institutions of something that you might have come across called greenwashing um, where um, campaigners feel that organizations who are currently damaging the ecology and the environment are um, using their investment in culture and the arts as a way of um, justifying themselves. Those are issues and questions I'm throwing out to you within this presentation for you to give some thought to and perhaps to investigate and think how appropriate it might be to address these um, with some of your students. So looking at the Holborn Museum displays, the, this is a very new display. This has just opened um, since the pandem pandemic. And it's a very powerful room. It's upstairs. If you guys say I'd recommend you go to the Holborn. And if you go in there, you will see that um, the almost the entire room is dedicated to, in one form or another, looking at the legacy of slavery and discussing how the family links with slave trade at Bull's Plantation impacted in terms of their wealth and what they were able to spend that wealth on, um, which included collections, art collections, which have then been displayed within the Holborn. And you will see um, in the centre and on the right, there is an artwork, an installation which has been created. Uh, it's a very mu moving piece. And there is a poem, an epitaph for those who survived to labour on Ball's plantation, Barbados, because as we know, many slaves didn't even survive the terrible journey. They, were, uh, they died or they were actually slaughtered 
by being thrown into the sea. That did happen. We know that that happened to some slaves. What lays behind these broken pages? Measurements of raindrops, cane cut, sugar boiled, and blood spilt have disposed. But in their place, families both living and dead persist. And below that, there is a book, a battered book, and this is the Plantation Day book. And up until very recently, this was um, available to be seen within the museum, but it was in a sense almost hidden or buried uh, within one of the pull-out drawers. And it was very easy for people to miss the Plantation book and not see it. Um, so you can see on the side of the vitrine housing, now housing the plantation book in a central position with the room are a number of names and they are the names of some of the slaves who worked uh, in an enslaved manner on the Bulls plantation owned by the Holborn family. So um, for many years, I have actually been flagging up these issues to students. Um, so you can imagine how thrilled I was to see uh, this powerful display. But it was possible to actually engage with culture, with um, diversity, with ethnicity, and with some of the histories um, by looking at the exhibits and tracking them through. So. Um, if you look at the uh, at the reading that I've given you, um, cultural placements, a sense of self, a sense of place, I do talk about this. And um, as I say, I have worked with a number of student groups bringing in post-16 students and students uh, on the autistic spectrum and SEND students um, to explore and creatively respond to the exhibits. So I'm just going to uh, present you a couple of these uh, projects so you can get a flavour of them. So the first one is uh, a passion for pattern, culture and meaning. And the idea behind this was that we all love pattern, we all respond to pattern, but it's more than just um, attractive shapes or bold designs. Pattern frequently has meaning, frequently has cultural significance. And if we look at um, museum exhibits in that way, we can actually engage in a much deeper way with what we're looking at. Um, the objects, which might be domestic objects, decorative objects, um, applied art, ceramics, textiles, glass, um, silverware, um, all of these are objects that are within the Holborn Museum and they will have a story. So pattern, culture and meaning um, aim to support students right across the board of abilities and needs in engaging with those stories through a range of uh, printmaking in order to create collaborative banners. So you can see them at work um, on these collaborative banners. Diverse learners explore the meaning of patterns from a range of cultures and context, creating mixed media printed banners in collaborative groups. And you can see um, the students here who are um, from uh, Fosway School um, and Three Way School, students with a range of additional needs who respond to art and design and opportunities for creative engagement with great enthusiasm and pattern and passion. And post 16 students, so these are. Um, upper six, they're about to embark on moving their uh, careers into art school, many of them, and they responded to the, the topic, again, with great verve and enthusiasm. And we also gave them the chance to do a crit, to, to present their work, to discuss their work, to account for their work, um, and have it discussed by their peers, and also by the PGC art students who were involved in the project. So this was a great opportunity for them to build their confidence and esteem. 
And then the display where the banners were actually displayed within the museum setting. And that was very empowering for all students. So displayed together was the work of uh, collaborative work, um, students with a range of additional needs, post 16 students about to embark on an art school transition and PGC students already with degrees and practicing artists. So that sharing, that is genuinely empowering to share culture and share practice and share knowledge. And with that, build that inclusive pedagogy. So these are some of the responses. The next generation of teachers are discovering the potential of museums to inspire their practice. And that was Christina Parker, then Director of Education at the museum and um, a PGC trainee. The Holborn project was a valuable experience and a learning curve for me. It showed how every culture has its own approach to design and that meaning is expressed through art. And then the second project I'm going to share with you is much more closely linked uh, with the room um, that flags up the Holborn family background and its links with the slave trade. Um, that was a possible strand, although all the students did not pursue that particular area because this project is called Journeys. Um, it's also linked uh, in terms of the second webinar that you will watch, you will see resources that were produced for uh, migrant communities um, through an international project I was um, involved with called Arts Together. And this Journeys project also became a focus within that because we all travel and people throughout the globe, as well as animals and all species, have always traveled since the beginning of time. So Journeys project considered reasons why we might travel, leisure and pleasure, education, employment, but also necessity and safety. And that's where that uh, we see at the moment from Afghanistan, people fleeing for their lives, escaping if they can. And this is not pleasure travel, this is travel to survive. So students involved and PGC Art and Design uh, trainees involved with this project research the origins, culture and meaning of the museum's artefacts. And some of these artefacts you can see on the left were quite intriguing examples of previous travel. And this is Sir William Holborn's passport. A passport is an absolute vital thing. Um, if we don't have one, we can be regarded as stateless and then have very few rights, global rights, they are taken from us. So this was Sir William Holborn's passport and you can see his transition through Europe um, where he made this extraordinary grand tour and collected artifacts. And a number of um, groups were fascinated by this and decided to create their own banners exploring passport and visa stamps. And then there were groups who wanted to directly reference the links. And this was prior to the room being set up, but we did have access to um, displays, the sugar spoons, and below the sugar spoons then um, was the day book, um, the plantation book. But all of this now is, and I do encourage you to visit, is very well displayed and the links are very clear now. They don't have to be, if you like, excavated within the museum. The museum themselves are presenting these links. Um, and you can see campaigners, um, both from the um, community of colour and um, the, the white community who have uh, uh, campaigned against slavery and this um, medallion created by the uh, ceramicist Josiah Wedgwood um, is there to be viewed and it's a powerful piece, Am I Not a Man and a Brother? On the right you can see a, a very powerful and uh, stunningly designed banner uh, which was created by a group of post-16 students 
and it evoked the idea of trade and how humans were traded uh, along with other objects like alcohol and um, clothing and they were seen as commodities to be traded. And here's a couple more banners that explore that idea of collecting, collecting artifacts and beautiful things, and also the process of traveling. And you've got teapot, you've got that tea pouring into the sea, um, evoking um, the, uh, the, the American war. And um, you've also got boats and a sense of internationalism in that banner below, international movement and travel. So the evaluation from Anna Lundy, head of art, uh, who was participant with her students in this project, was the Holborn Museum provides a great environment for learning and the cultural and historical themes were stimulating. So I'd like you to think, how could the American Museum create inspiration for a creative arts project to engage with issues of inclusion and diversity relevant to um, its artifacts and displays. And finally, in this section, M Shed, another very close museum um, to here in Bristol, and everybody will know about the Black Lives Matter protests which happened. Um, where the Colston statue was pulled down in June 2020 during the Black Lives Matter protest in Bristol. Colston, who was a slaver, uh, was, it was felt, glorified. And in fact, the plinth uh, held a plaque which talked about Edward Colston as, uh, I can't remember the exact word, but something like one of the kindest and most gentle um, uh, citizens of Bristol and talked about the money that he gave to charity and uh, this was put up after his death and there were at the time immediate um, complaints and criticism of the glorification of Edward Colston that was uh, at the in the Victorian period and it has taken hundred years for that statue to come down so it's worth thinking about that um, I recommend you go to see this presentation this display in M Shed. M Shed is a superb museum which really does give a, a full picture of the diversity of life in Bristol and um, the history of this this conflict in dissent and then make up your own mind what you feel do you think that the the, the sculpture should have been pulled down um, do you think it belongs in the museum would you rather see it back where it was would you rather see it destroyed entirely what are your thoughts you will if you go to the to the museum or you go online have the opportunity to give your thoughts uh, because these are all being collated so the last part of this presentation, I'm looking at global textiles, which is an area that you will be pursuing in your studio practice uh, during the rest of today and over the next few weeks, developing your printmaking and textiles activity. And I just wanted to show you some, just a few uh, slides of inspirational images um, with the hope that you will then go away and do more research and find your own. So starting with the quilts at the American Museum, you would have no doubt seen and uh, been struck by or I should think by some of the amazing quilts that are on display in that collection. Here are a few that I found on the permanent collection website. And um, I would ask you, what stories do they tell? Some of the abstract quilts may tell a stronger story, a stronger narrative of some of, uh, some of the more figurative. But this could be a question that we ask when we look at global artifacts, not just textiles, but any global artifacts, or indeed artwork of any period, place or time, what stories are we 
being told? What information are we being given? How are these artifacts expanding our understanding of the world and of people of the world? And then at the Holborn Museum, um, they have also a collection of textiles. And this particular set rather delighted me because we look at the images of clothing of women in the 21st century and then we look at this 19th century top and I was quite amazed to think uh, that this might be something we might consider wearing more now in the Western world in the 21st century and yet that is part of um, the life of Iran in the 19th century and the beautiful uh, decorative embroidery and shapes and patterns uh, give much to research and explore in terms of the stories that they tell and the shifts in uh, things like if we're thinking about textiles clothing what do the shifts in clothing design say about our attitudes and it's not a superficial thing. Clothing is, is actually at the heart of how we see ourselves, how we think, how we present ourselves. And that can be a very um, rich area to uh, explore and research. And then at the Bristol Museum, um, they have an extensive uh, collection of Adinkra cloth. Um, Bristol has... Um, a considerable African Caribbean um, community, and they there are some wonderful collections of cloth, not all on display all the time, but you can see them um, on their website. Uh, and I've given you the Bristol Museum website, which you can look up. And um, here is a, a, an example of a sculpture by Yinka Shonibare. He's an artist that I mention um, in one of my other presentations so i'm trying to link up some of these presentations together so that you can see the kind of threads and themes and ideas running through them and he is an artist who directly explores the idea of empire and what what has what stories has empire told us and to what extent are they true or not true how would we consider them now and uh, in this particular um, sculpture, he, he explores the idea, as he does in, in a number of his works, that clothing and cloth that we consider to be African um, actually was created uh, in Holland. It's Dutch wax textiles. And the, the techniques from that came more from countries like Malaysia. So that kind of synergy, synthesis, cross-fertilization of cultural ideas um, and appropriation, we could say, of cultural ideas has been going on a very long time. And more contemporary global textiles, this is a great website I've given you at the end. Um, and you can see there are artists, um, Sheila Hicks, who also says, textile is a universal language in all of the cultures of the world textile is a crucial and essential component um, in the center faith ringold who is um, an african-american artist uh, who is certainly worth looking up and exploring the stories that she tells through her work whether it's paintings um, whether it's textiles and um, caro halford you pluck up a felt tip pen and this work very textural work which says something about the environment and something about personal engagement with the materials um, and how we uh, explore and relate to them the world textile art organization another one i'd recommend you look up there's masses of material on their site which i've given you um, on the link document and you can just see a small selection here uh, from competition with the prize winners um, working in a wide range of uh, media and scale and two of our uh, 
prize-winning contemporary artists, Grayson Perry and Tracy Emin, who both use textiles as a way of exploring ideas, um, discussing identity, staking out, if you like, uh, reinforcing their own identity and exploring the idea of the identities of others and the beliefs of others. So two very um, challenging and interesting um, artist work in textiles to explore and lots to discuss with students um, if you show them the work. Obviously, particularly I would say with Tracy Emin, but with both of those artists, you need to be considerate of what is appropriate, perhaps discuss that. Uh, if you were going into school and showing the artist's work, you'd have to think about maybe this would be suitable for sixth form, but also it would depend on the school and their attitudes. So you would need to discuss that. And my modern Met, again, not only some great textiles here, um, huge installations, uh, small scale pieces, um, some that is almost like jewellery and some that is architectural, uh, but also a really interesting article for you to look at. Um, so please do dip into that. And here's some textile constructions. Um, these are uh, sort of gathered over a few years. Uh, challenge to PGC art and design BSTs to say, okay, take the techniques of textiles, the weaving, um, the embroidery, but use a variety of non-traditional materials and see what you come up with. And these are some of the exciting outcomes that they um, developed. So I give that to you as also a challenge to see how can you develop those ideas into a piece of unique art. And developing on from this presentation, there's lots for you to read, lots for you to research and look at. Um, you're also going to be working in the studio with Esther. So um, what you need to do, as with all studio sessions, is uh, watch the Creative Safe Practice videos, and you've got my link for that. Um, research uh, the artist's textiles for inspiration. And of course, use your own images as a starting point. Um, I'm sure you've taken photographs and made sketches in your museum uh, visits. Um, share your lesson plans. Think about what did you come up with for the printing exercise and how can that then be developed for the textiles lesson to promote um, global ideas and approaches. So lots to do there. And finally, there's the links here for you to look at and uh, read and explore for the museums. Further links for the readings um, for you to dip into. So I hope you've enjoyed this session. There's lots for you to think about. I'll encourage, I hope to encourage you to go see, explore, look at what's out there. There's absolutely masses of stimulating, exciting and interesting work um, in this field. Uh, both contemporary and historical, and absolutely globally. So go there and have fun.